Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate everyone coming out tonight, and I really appreciate the, uh, the invitation from the center uh, and all the work that Doug and Kate have done um, and getting me here. And uh, I thank you, everybody, for coming. So uh, I guess I'll just get right into it. Uh, this is appropriate that we're all sitting down and eating dinner here tonight uh, because what I'm concerned with or what I'm going to talk about is really diet and how your diet and the things you eat affect your oral health, your dentition. Of course, your dentist will tell you that and, and tell you to brush and floss every day. But uh, this is something that I think is also extremely important for understanding uh, the behaviors of prehistoric peoples and of historic peoples and that, you know, peoples of the past for the most part, and to better understand how we humans as a species sort of evolved and as we evolved and sort of developed culture and become more advanced and uh, more civilized as it were, how it starts this positive feedback cycle which then ends up feeding back into itself and, and creating actually more dental health problems for ourselves and ends up decreasing our healthiness and increasing our disease loads, uh, things that we can see across the planet today um, in third world countries as well, in some cases in our own, uh, in our own backyard. So really I just want to start, before I talk about my research, I want, to, I want to introduce two concepts that are important to understand what I'm talking about today and how I approach this. The first is um, starting in, well, starting in well before the 20s, but uh, particularly in the 20s and later in the 50s, there was this concept that the agricultural revolution, the, the Neolithic revolution, that the, the domestication of plants and animals really contributed to the advancement of society and the, and the creation of civilization around the planet in the numerous centers of domestication that, the, the, that we've documented in addition to places where plants and animals spread and, and agricultural technology spread. Um, <clears throat> and that part of that was an improvement in health and, and, and part of the evidence for that was the explosion of populations that are associated with the Neolithic or that were associated with agriculture. But starting in the 70s in particular and a little earlier, uh, some researchers started to question that, and they realized that it, in actuality, uh, sedentism and agriculture and, and the diet associated with it, as well as population densities, and uh, those things all sort of ended up contributing to poorer health among civilized societies. And so, as a result, that questioning of that, that original paradigm has really changed our view of what, uh, what contributed to civilization and what contributes to, as a matter of fact, the patterns of disease that we often and see in modern populations today. Uh, for example, tuberculosis, something that we actually know nowadays that's been around for almost a million years, if not more. We just at least have the evidence that traces back to about a million years, uh, probably associated with Homo erectus. But it wasn't really, and so this was a disease that was likely carried along with foraging groups across the planet for a long time, well, at least a million years, until the advent of permanent settled agricultural communities. And then there was an explosion of tuberculosis. And this is something that, through World Health Organizations and, 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 and NGOs, that this is a disease that was sort of brought under some, some sort of control, and then as a result of a whole uh, series of cultural processes, has now exploded again. And now we've got other strains of tuberculosis and, and, and versions that are uh, almost incurable. So this is sort of, this is, this is the applicability of, this, uh, of these understandings. So the concept that with agriculture and with the development of these, these technologies, our health as a human society started to decline. We started to experience more health problems, uh, which we really have our own causing for the most part. The other concept that's important is that these patterns, and particularly in the teeth, which is what I'm going to talk about today, can be observed, uh, general patterns can be observed associated with a particular lifestyle. So of course the, the ultimate dichotomy that we like to look at is foraging groups or living a hunter and gatherer lifestyle and what diet and lifestyle was like and what that meant for uh, health of populations versus agriculturalist groups, groups living in permanent settlements uh, in some, you know, depending on the size of the settlement and some sort of major density. Uh, and the restriction of a diet, the, the constriction of diet to a couple of, of staples like wheat or corn or potatoes, for example, the increased contact with animals, uh, you know, keeping animals in your house or, or close contact with them and their waste. All these things end up helping to spread communicable disease. Uh, but in particular, diet, that restriction of dietary breath 
really contributes to nutritional deficiencies. And in addition, you're also looking at increasing the productivity of the plants that you are producing by processing them more. And so by processing them, you actually end up softening your diet quite a bit. So the, the generalized dichotomy that we always, or at least for the past 30 years or so, we really approached the, uh, prehistoric societies in this transition was looking at foragers or hunter-gatherers versus agriculturalists. And foragers commonly classified as having sort of heavy dental wear. Very heavy dental wear that often keeps off cavities and, uh, and prevents uh, calculus from forming and, and, and plaque and things like that. So as a result, you have very few dental health problems, but you also have extremely fast wear that happens on the teeth. Um, and this can often actually end up causing tooth loss as well. You wear a tooth down to its roots, uh, you're often going to end up losing the tooth. And this is common in some, uh, well, commonly observed in foraging societies across the prehistoric and otherwise across the planet. And then agriculturalists with their limited dietary breadth and in particular that, that investment in heavily processed foods uh, and, and those that are domesticated, like corn, for example, in particular in this area, uh, you're going to see an increase in cavities. You're going to see an increase in tooth loss and periodontal disease because at the same time, you're also seeing a decrease in the type of wear or a, a change in the type of wear, I should say. Uh, whereas before, it was really the food and the, the tough consistency of the food that was causing your teeth to wear relatively flat. Now, with no real resistance uh, on your teeth because the food is so soft, now you're getting tooth on tooth contact and what you actually end up producing is angled wear. Your teeth aren't set flat against each other. As we all know, you've got cusps and all kinds of topography to your teeth. And so in particular, molars end up rubbing at an angle against each other. And over time, if you've got tooth on tooth contact, what you're going to see is an angled wear to your teeth. And uh, you can actually you can see this in, in, in some older individuals, especially uh, individuals that have bruxism or, or grinding their teeth during, uh, during the night. So you often end up seeing some of these patterns. So those are the two basic concepts that, that are important to understand before I sort of launch into what I uh, am interested in or what I do. So given those concepts, what I was really interested in was looking at this transition to agriculture in our own backyard, in the Sonoran Desert in particular. And I started, I was invited to work um, uh, with several colleagues of mine at a site in northern Mexico called La Playa, which is contemporaneous with the Las Capas site, for those of you that uh, came to that archaeology cafe. So Las Capas has a lot of really recent, important, exciting discoveries there uh, that desert archaeology has found. Well, we've got a similar thing going on just south of the border at this site called La Playa. Uh, which means the beach, but there isn't a beach nearby from 100 kilometers. So, so uh, and when you're there in the summer, you really it's not a, it's no picnic at the beach. So, uh, and so my interest is really trying to understand what the effects of this transition to agriculture had on a diet and on health, in particular oral health, in these populations as as they made this transition from food foraging to agricultural investment. And I expected to see these patterns, this, this transition from heavy wear to angled wear, from, from minimal dental disease to increased dental disease that you see in common among other foraging groups and, and other agricultural groups across the planet. But there was a confounding factor, and that is the Sonoran Desert itself one of the richest deserts biotically in the world. In fact, it barely qualifies as a desert. Um, I lived in Vegas for years. Now that's a desert. And, and, and I, don't know, it's, I mean, you don't, you don't see trees when you look out across the landscape. Uh, driving across town, I always appreciate that it's green. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a desert. But that's right, we'll qualify it as a desert. A lot of spiny things that end up hurting you. So that also uh, helps qualify it as a desert. I'll talk a little bit about uh, my trip to northern Chile to the Atacama Desert, which is the driest desert in the world. So these are all desert. I mean, seriously, there's been places where there's not a drop of rain that's fallen for 100 years. So those are real deserts. There's not a plant to be seen in sight unless someone's irrigated it. So the Sonoran Desert, extremely rich biotically. Uh, plants, animals, there's a variety of species of, of all those that are edible, which is the nice thing about living in this type of desert. A lot of tasty things running around or growing right under your feet. And of course, the native groups that, that, that occupied and lived in this area knew all about all these. Well, the interesting thing is, what I found was that the transition from foraging to agriculture in the Sonoran Desert 
didn't have an impact on oral health. You didn't see an increase in cavities. You didn't see an increase in periodontal disease or tooth loss because, come to find out, the simple consumption that foraging groups were doing in the desert, in the Sonoran Desert, was actually contributing to poor oral health as it was. It was contributing to caries. It was contributing to cavities and, and tooth loss. It's because a lot of the, the, the local resources out here are also high in sugar. Cactus, for example. Cactus pads are edible. Nothing like growing up some Nepal uh, right on the grill with your, with your carne asada. Cactus fruits are edible, or even better, can be fermented into, into fruit wine, and all those things are nice and sugary and can get stuck in your teeth. Um, uh, mesquite beans are also very sugary, and these things were processed well into antiquity and also provide nice substances that get stuck in your teeth and can cause cavities, for example. Uh, agave hearts. Agave cultivation goes back for, we're not even sure how far because it's, stuff, it's difficult to establish since it was never really, uh, at least prehistorically, it was never really truly domesticated. So, uh, but the consumption of these things, the inside of an agave heart has 95% sugar. All the rest is water. So, I mean, that's extremely uh, tasty. Uh, but also, cavity causing, it's karyogenic. That's a new word that you guys can all write that one down. That's, I, I like to pull that out when I want to sound smart. Karyogenic, it causes cavities. That's right. And the, the great thing about the Sonoran Desert and this richness that it has is that this richness has been here for a long time, even through the climatic fluctuations of the Sonoran Desert. And so it's interesting to think about such a rich biotic community and the people that occupy this desert and that settled here and that could have possibly had permanent settlements here well before agriculture developed. But something changed. Something changed their minds and places like Las Capas and La Playa are excellent examples of people making decisions in the past despite the fact they live in an extremely rich environment. And you know, uh, some of the estimates as far as population size of places like Las Capas and, and Rio Nuevo and some of the other places that have this, what are known as the early agricultural component, aren't really that big. They're, they're very small villages. They're villages that would certainly be on the level of uh, you know, groups of foragers as well, 50 to 100 people maximum. Uh, so if those groups can live off the landscape as, as for, simply foraging the landscape and using resources that are close by up in the mountains as well as in the valley floors, there had to have been an intentional process in accepting this new technology, which was domesticated plants, and the technology associated with growing it, agriculture. And the great thing is also, for those of you that are here for the last Capos um, talk, is that in the Sonoran Desert, we have some of the earliest evidence of canals, irrigation canals, in North America, which is a whole other level of thinking about modifying the landscape, making purposeful decisions to invest in particular things, like this new corn which is an extremely stable resource. There's reasons why you know, people across the, all of North and South America invested heavily in corn agriculture, as well as the whole Mesoamerican crop complex, including beans and squash. But, and, and the same reason why, uh, for example, when it was introduced in Africa, it, it spread like wildfire and became a major staple of many uh, sub-Saharan African communities because it's, it's an it's a easily grown, nicely compact, high calorie, uh, food, but it also has issues with nutritional deficiencies. So, uh, corns is a, a really brilliant food source, and it, it makes sense that people would want to invest in it in particular, uh, especially since it is potentially difficult to control wild resources. But again, the Sonoran Desert being so rich, um, uh, maybe it has to do with security more than anything. So, really, the, the thing that I want to bring home with that is that. This transition to agriculture in the Sonoran Desert, I think really had more to do with choices of the people and the idea of investment in particular things. It's well known that well, well into the, to the Holocom period, the later what we consider fully agricultural formative period uh, societies in, the southern, in southern Arizona, they were still exploiting these resources. Uh, these resources, you know, you, it, they're difficult to over-exploit because when they're done, you know, when you picked all the mesquite beans or all the, nipped off all the cactus fruit, but there's not more to, to overexploit. You're not going to kill the plant, so they'll grow back next year. And you can do things to, to uh, 
to maybe even encourage them to grow back next year and grow back better. So these resources were always available. Somewhat different than, for example, up on the Colorado Plateau, where there's a diversity of cactuses is, uh, is, is far less. And as a result, one of the things you see is during times of drought, cactus were, was, a, was an emergency food. Not so the case here in the Sonoran Desert. So um, it's interesting to think about that process in, in some place that was so rich that people started to invest in agriculture and this new technology. And then, of course, it, it, it allowed the populations in this area to bloom and really exploit that much more out of the landscape and get that much more out of the landscape. So this was an interesting discovery. There's a few places uh, around the world that I, I, I did my research after I thought about the local ecology and, and how it would have affected oral health in particular. And uh, there's a few places where I discovered a similar pattern. Um, among archaic peoples in southern Texas, right along the Rio Grande, or Rio Bravo, depending on what side of the border you're on. Uh, these groups were living a foraging lifestyle for thousands of years. Uh, never, agriculture never really uh, had any impact in this area. And one of the things that they would commonly eat would be agave and cactus pads. And one of the things you see is they had for a completely foraging group, a foraging lifestyle, pure hunters and gatherers, they had horrible teeth, terrible cavities, all kinds of tooth loss. Just, it was because they were consuming an almost sugary, all sugary diet because they lacked some of the things that makes the variety so special in the Sonoran Desert, like um, Kinopodium and other uh, seedy annuals and, and grasses and things like that, as well as mesquites and whatnot. So. So as a result, they had really, really bad teeth. You certainly wouldn't want to be uh, a forager having to gum your way through uh, that kind of diet. <clears throat> Another place where it was really interesting to see was uh, in Southeast Asia as well. In this case, uh, you have the introduction of rice, which spread like wildfire all throughout Eastern Asia and ends up being the foundation for some of the major civilizations that you see um, in, in China, for example, in Southeast Asia, and, and these places that you, you hear about that are so amazing and, and, and wonderful. But in this case, the native diet, the, the foraging diet prior to um, prior to the arrival of, or the domestication of rice, was a really rich, uh, starchy tuber, high in sugar, uh, something like manioc. And as a result, they had also, the foraging groups had really bad teeth. So when rice was introduced, it was low in sugar, uh, also initially very low uh, minimal processing as well to rice. And so as a result, you see their, their dental health actually gets better. They improve, they stop losing their teeth, they stop having cavities, stop having large gaps in their smile, something to consider. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of places around the planet where the pattern doesn't hold true. In fact, you often see the reverse. So I, I think that was really the, the major lesson that I, wanted, that I took out of that, uh, that, that research was that local ecology and the decisions of the people living in that local ecology, it's about adaptation. It's about adaptation to a particular environment, and you can adapt in a myriad of different ways, uh, in a thousand different ways. And that's what created the diversity of cultures that we see around the world today, is the different ways of adapting those different environments. Um, they could have, you know, you could have probably built large complex societies in this area uh, without investing so heavily in agriculture, but that wasn't the case. They chose to make these decisions. Uh, and of course, the local ecology probably supported that sort of thing. So I took this understanding and I was invited to, um, to do some research down in northern Chile by a, an old professor of mine. He wanted me to come down and I, so I, I applied for a Fulbright uh, scholarship and got it as a visiting uh, professor down there. So I just spent, what, two months ago now? I, I just, we just came back, my, uh, my family and I just came back from four months in Chile. It was just in the lab all the time, looking at, looking at teeth, looking at teeth. Looked it over, was it uh, 600 crania, over 15,000 teeth. So if you think your jobs are boring, just imagine how many. It wasn't all bad. I taught a couple of classes and got in the field and excavated some really neat stuff. Also got to see and, and hang out with the world's oldest artificial mummies in the world, the Chinchoro people, so very cool. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, as I was down there, I thought, boy, 
This is the absolute opposite to what the Sonoran Desert is. It's a desert for sure, but as I said, the Atacama Desert is absolutely the driest in the world. In fact, NASA does experiments in the soil in the Atacama Desert to simulate the surface of Mars because there's no biotic organism in the soil. Uh, and for that reason, I believe no one should live there either. But no, actually, the climate was really nice. I can't complain. And we lived right on the beach, so excellent seafood and good views. And it was really good because uh, it was winter down there while it was summer here. So that was also ideal until we came back in uh, mid-July. So and then I regret that decision. Should have stayed for longer. That's it. Okay, so the idea was, okay, in this case, we've got, to, we've got to have a totally different circumstance, right? In this case, we've got no plants to speak of whatsoever. The interesting thing about the northern coast of Chile and the southern coast of Peru in this Atacama Desert is that you also have an amazing diversity of landscape. And in this case, you have a very, really a very narrow, narrow stretch of land. And then from that stretch of land, the mountains or the foothills to the Andes, they certainly wouldn't call them mountains there. They say, oh, those are little cerritos. They're little hills. That's nothing. These little hills rise up to 14,000 feet and more into the Altiplano, into the high Andes. And so what connects these, the coastline to the Andes, to the Altiplano, are these really thin, narrow river valleys, which are really steep. Uh, but it's great because you can drive up in a day without an issue, so. Uh, which also gets you in trouble because then you start bonking out from oxygen, the change in oxygen pressure. Uh, so don't try that. <clears throat> uh, so in this case, you, you, you have the potential to access very diverse uh, ecological zones along what's referred to as this corridor, this, this ecological corridor, this highland corridor. Uh, and very early on, anthropologists, archaeologists hypothesized that there was a great deal of contact, and there's evidence for it as well, between people in the Altiplano, foragers on the Altiplano,